Coming up on this Monday edition of Newsline at Noon, South Korea proposes working level talks with North Korea to arrange inter Korean family reunions next month at the North's Mount Kumgangsan Resort after Pyongyang agreed last Friday to hold the reunions. In an effort to contain the spread of bird flu ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday this week, authorities issue a new travel ban on poultry and livestock as well as farmers, this time covering large parts of central and southern Korea. Plus, the Syrian government and the opposition agree to allow women and children out of the besieged city of homes. The warring sides now face the tough task of compromising on serious political transition. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Choi Yuzan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's start with the latest development in the seemingly thawing relations between the two Koreas. Amid the more amicable atmosphere, South Korea has proposed dates for resuming the long-suspended reunions for families separated since the Korean War. Well, that seems all well and good. North Korea's reaction to upcoming joint military drills between Seoul and Washington could throw a spanner in the works. Our Hwang Sung-hee reports. Families separated since the Korean War will have the chance to see each other again in mid-February if North Korea agrees to the South's offer. Seoul's Unification Ministry said it made the proposal through the Inter-Korean hotline on Monday morning. Considering the wishes of the separated families, we propose holding a round of family reunions at Mount Kungangsan from February 17th to the 22nd for six days. The ministry also offered to hold working-level talks on Wednesday at the North Korean side of the truce village of Panmunjom to fine-tune the details of the event. The North took many by surprise with its sudden proposal last Friday that the reunions resume at a convenient time for South Korea after the Lunar New Year holiday, which falls at the end of this week. If the event takes place next month, 100 divided family members from each side will be reunited. Millions of Koreans were separated from their loved ones when the country was divided more than six decades ago. Around 72-thousand South Koreans are on the waiting list for a chance to meet their families one last time, although time is running out for the very elderly relatives. Despite the friendlier tone in recent weeks, preparations for the event may run into some problems due to the upcoming joint military drills between South Korea and the United States. The South Korean government has made clear the drills will take place as scheduled, starting at the end of February despite North Korea's repeated calls to cancel what it views as war games. This year's training, however, will not involve U.S. aircraft carriers or strategic bombers. Seoul is expected to notify its neighbors, including Pyongyang, of the schedule and purpose of the exercises after the Lunar New Year holiday. Hwang sang Arirang News. The U.S. envoy on North Korea has called on Pyongyang to take more meaningful steps toward peaceful reconciliation. Talking to reporters in Beijing on Sunday, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Policy Glenn Davies said that the most important task for Pyongyang is to go beyond its recent charm offensive, which includes a proposal for reunions for families separated since the Korean War. Davies said he can't pinpoint the reasons for the North's recent actions, but said this is not the first time Pyongyang has shown interest in reconciliation. Davies will meet with his Chinese counterpart Wu Dawei and other high-ranking officials in Beijing until Tuesday before heading to Seoul and then to Tokyo. Now to some truly chilling news if it turns out to be true. Multiple sources claim that direct relatives of the recently executed Chang Song Tech have all been executed on the orders of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Citing the sources, Seoul-based Yenap News reports, entire families directly related to Chang, who was executed in December for plotting to overthrow the regime, were put to death with their children and grandchildren. 
The sources say those killed include Chang's sister Chang Ye Sun, her husband and ambassador to Cuba, Chen Yong Jin, as well as Chang's nephew, Chang Yong Chol, ambassador to Malaysia. The details have not been confirmed by the North or South Korean governments, but analysts say recent events in the North suggest the sources' claims could be true. A visiting U.S. official has emphasized the need to improve strained ties between Korea and Japan. After meeting with Korean officials in Seoul Sunday, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia Daniel Russell said the world cannot afford strained ties between the two leading democracies in the region. His comments suggest Washington may consider acting as a mediator to improve relations strained by a series of historical and territorial disputes. While tensions between Tokyo and Beijing have also intensified, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, speaking to CNN, said China must have good relations with its neighbors to maintain economic development. Abe then said Japan does not want to engage in a military confrontation with China, but has the responsibility of protecting its land and waters. One of the few remaining Korean victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery has passed away at the age of 90. Hwang gum ja who was seized at the age of 13 and later forced to serve in Japanese military brothels during the colonial era, died of old age early Sunday. With Hwang's passing, only 55 out of nearly 240 registered Korean victims are still alive. While it's race against time for the elderly victims waiting for a sincere apology from Tokyo for its past atrocities, the new head of Japan's national broadcaster, NHA, Kasuto Momii, says military sex slaves existed in all countries that engaged in war. Momi then reiterated Tokyo's position, saying compensation for the former sex slaves was settled in a bilateral pact in 1965. Moving now to the bird flu crisis affecting the southern and central regions of Korea. The government has ordered a new temporary standstill on the movement of poultry, livestock and farm workers. This is the second movement ban since the virus broke out more than 10 days ago. Our Kwon Soa reports. It was a busy weekend for disease prevention authorities as areas with confirmed or suspected bird flu cases are being supervised around the clock. Despite their best efforts, the rising number of confirmed cases prompted the government on Sunday to issue a 12-hour standstill from Monday morning on the movement of any livestock, farm workers and vehicles in Gyeonggi-do, Chungcheongnam-do and Chungcheongbuk-do province, which includes the administrative city of Sejong and Daejeon. The standstill came into effect at 6 a.m. on Monday and will be lifted at 6 p.m. The government took the step as fears grow the virus could spread throughout the entire nation, especially after the highly pathogenic H5N8 strain was confirmed in more ducks over the weekend, including on a farm in Korea's southern Jeollanamdo province. Further north in Buya, Chungcheongnam-do province, the virus has been confirmed in chickens for the first time. This is especially concerning as chickens are more vulnerable to the virus and they greatly outnumber the number of ducks. The highly pathogenic bird flu virus spreads at a very fast speed among chickens. That's why we decided to call more of them as a preventive measure. With that in mind, authorities have decided to cull all ducks and chickens within a three-kilometer radius of six regions along the west coast. Nearly half a million birds have been culled so far, with another 2.2 million expected to be slaughtered over the coming days. The virus has also been found in migratory bird droppings at Xihuaho Lake in Hwasong, Gyeonggi-do province. This is the most northern point in which the virus has been detected, increasing worries it could spread to the Seoul metropolitan area. More cases are predicted to show up this week, especially since the virus has an incubation period of 7 to 21 days. Prime Minister Jong Hong won has ordered a state of emergency and has called for special attention ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday, which begins on Thursday. Kwon so Arirang News. Now, as the dust settles on one of the largest ever personal and financial data leaks in Korea's 
history. The country's main political parties have been rolling out their own measures to investigate the matter, and the National Assembly will revise a related law to bring the crisis under control, our Jimmy Gill reports. In the wake of the massive data leak, Korea's National Assembly plans to pass a revision to the Personal Information Protection Act at next month's extraordinary session. The revision will form a legal framework to make mobile spam messages illegal and clamp down on voice phishing, both of which are the most common forms of financial fraud. Financial firms will also be restricted from sharing their clients' personal information with their affiliates to prevent secondary damages. The leader of the main opposition Democratic Party, Kim An gil has proposed the National Assembly form a special committee to find out how the data breaches were able to happen. Kim is also demanding government and presidential office officials step down to take responsibility for the leaks. There should be a full-scale personnel shakeup at the presidential office of Cheong Wade and the cabinet, as these leaks were brought on by President Park Geun-hye's uncommunicative politics. He also urged the ruling Senori party to accept his party's proposal of setting up a special committee to oversee a parliamentary probe into the matter. Kim said the government must determine the causes of the leaks and come up with preventive measures. However, the Senori party says it's opposed to Kim's proposal, as the matter can be handled by one of the National Assembly's standing committees. A separate parliamentary probe by a special committee is unnecessary. Our top priority is to bring the situation under control. President Park has promised to hold people accountable. At an emergency meeting with related ministers on Sunday, Prime Minister Cheong Hong won ordered the establishment of a government-wide task force and to devise follow-up measures to bring the crisis under control. Ji Myung-gye, Arirang News. And President Park Geun-hye has waded in on the issue, making it clear her administration will hold those involved in the massive data leak responsible by launching a thorough investigation into all financial companies in the nation, including the three credit cards in question. Meeting with her top secretaries on Monday, the president described the leakage as, quote, something that should have never happened and ordered her official to devise fundamental measures to make sure customers do not suffer when financial firms collect and store personal data. She also called on financial firms to find other ways to identify individuals by benchmarking other countries rather than solely relying on resident registration numbers that are widely used here in Korea. Korean consumers continue to be optimistic about the economy and living conditions amid signs the local recovery is firmly on the recovery track. The Bank of Korea says the Consumer Sentiment Index for the month of January came in at 109, up two points from last month and the highest reading in nearly three years. A reading above 100 means that optimists outnumber pessimists. The figure has been over 100 for 13 straight months now, meaning Korean consumers continue to have a positive outlook on the Korean economy. Korea has become even more dependent on China as an export destination. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy says exports to China accounted for 26% of Korea's export total of $500 billion last year, the highest rate ever recorded. Mobile phone parts, semiconductors, auto parts and automobiles made up the bulk of exports to China, resulting in a trade surplus of 60 percent $0.6 billion, which is actually higher than Korea's export surplus, total export surplus of $44.2 billion. Experts say Korea should take a more aggressive approach in dealing with the ever-growing Chinese market, market, adding that it may need to reduce its dependence on China in the future, given its slowing economic growth. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. There's a glint of hope in otherwise tough talks in Geneva between the Syrian government and the Western-backed opposition. 
In the first deal struck from the latest round of talks, women and children will be allowed to leave the besieged city of homes. Our Connie Kim has the details. The Syrian government and the opposition Syrian National Coalition struck their first yet small agreement on the second day of their international peace talks in Geneva. Under the deal, women and children will be allowed to leave the besieged city of homes. Hopefully, starting tomorrow, women and children will be able to leave central, uh, central, uh, the old city in, uh, in Homs. Homs is a key battleground in the conflict with government forces pinning down rebels and civilians with heavy mortar attacks for more than one year. The two sides failed to reach common ground on sending humanitarian aid into homes on Saturday, but UN envoy Lakhdar Brahimi, who is acting as mediator between two sides, has admitted progress was always going to be slow. The core objective of the talks come on Monday as the two sides will begin to discuss political matters and specifically the establishment of a transitional government. Any transitional government would require President Bashar al-Assad to cede power, a condition the Syrian government refuses to accept. Syria's deputy foreign minister forced the government's position home on Sunday, saying Assad will remain in his post and continue to win elections. The opposition says the regime is stalling and said Monday's talks with Brahimi will show whether the government is willing to negotiate. Tomorrow, we'll start talking about transition uh, from dictatorship to democracy. Clearly, the regime is not enthusiastic to talk about that. Uh, and they are stalling. The Geneva meeting marks the first time in almost three years that the Syrian government and the main opposition group have held face-to-face -face talks aimed at ending the bitter civil war. It's estimated that more than 130,000 people have been killed in Syria since parts of the country rose up against President Assad in March 2011. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Egypt will have a new president before it has a new parliament after the country's interim government announced that the poll to find the next leader will come before parliamentary elections. Interim President Adli Mansour says he will ask the election commission to begin presidential candidate registration under the recently adopted constitution which calls for elections to be held within 90 days of its passage. Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is expected to run for president after he led the, the military coup overthrowing former Islamist President Mohamed Morsi in July of last year. The announcement follows the third anniversary of the revolution that led to the ousting of former dictator Hosni Mubarak. Reports say around 50 people were killed in clashes between police and anti-government protesters on Saturday. A Thai anti-government protest leader has been shot dead in Bangkok as violence erupted once again on Sunday in demonstrations aimed at blocking early voting ahead of next week's disputed general elections. Kim Min Ji has the details. Thousands of Thais were unable to cast their ballots on Sunday as anti-government demonstrators surrounded polling stations in Bangkok and southern parts of the country, obstructing early voting ahead of next week's general elections. An anti-government protest leader was killed as clashes erupted between protesters and government supporters. Police say Sutin Tartin was speaking on top of a truck when he was shot dead by an unidentified assailant. This brings a death toll to 10 with scores wounded since anti-government protests flared up in November. Protesters want Prime Minister Yingla Shinawat to resign, accusing her of being a puppet for her brother and exiled former leader Takshin Shinawat. They want an unelected people council that would oversee political reform. Last week, Thailand declared a state of emergency, raising doubts whether general elections could be held according to schedule. A Thai court ruled last Friday that the general vote scheduled for February 2nd could be postponed out of fear of violence and disruptions. This latest violence came despite pledges from protest leaders not to obstruct the advance elections. Early voting has been cancelled in at least 45 out of 50 polling stations in Bangkok, while voting was also disrupted at several venues in southern provinces. Some 49 million Thais are eligible to cast their votes, with over 2 million having registered for advanced voting. Kim Minji, Arirang News. 
Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics and Google have agreed on a global patent cross-licensing agreement. The new agreement will allow the two tech giants to share currently owned patents as well as any filed in the next 10 years, our Yulian reports. Samsung Electronics and Google, which are frequently involved in patent infringement lawsuits but not against each other, have agreed to share their existing patents and those filed over the next 10 years. Without providing details that two companies emphasized, the deal will help them better avoid litigation. The head of Samsung's Intellectual Property Center, An Seung Ho, said in a press release that Samsung and Google are showing the rest of the industry that there is more to gain from cooperating than engaging in unnecessary patent disputes. The sentiment was echoed by Google's Deputy General Counsel for Patents, Alan Lowe, who said through agreements like this, companies can reduce the potential for litigation and focus instead on innovation. The comments appear to have been a direct shot at Apple, with which the two companies have been engaged in a number of multinational patent battles. Samsung is the second largest patent holder in the United States, and Google is the 11th, and the deal is expected to give both an edge in upcoming patent battles. For Google, pundits say the deal has broad implications, considering its growing reach into hardware and wearables. With Samsung's hardware patent, Google can more easily expand into the wearable industry. Samsung, which seemed like it was trying to break away from Google's Android platform to develop a mobile platform of its own, will continue to work with Google in that realm. Looking ahead, the deal is also expected to lead to deeper collaboration on research and development of future projects. Yurian, Arirang News. OK, well, let's get a check now on the weather with our weathercast, E. Jian, who's standing by at the Weather Center. Hello there, Jian. Good afternoon, Mark and Yusan. Well, guys, we have the Lunar New Year holiday coming up on Thursday, making it a busy and exciting week. It sure is. People are already busy shopping for presents for right. their families and friends. Right. So, Jian, what are some of the most popular gifts this year? Well, Yusan, ginseng is the number one item, and hanu, or Korean beef, is the next most popular gift gift this year. Well, it was cold this morning, but temperatures will rise quickly and get up to well above the seasonal norms. And the level of fine dust particles should be normal. And we could expect to have mostly sunny skies in the entire nation today. So it will be a good day to get outside and enjoy the weather condition. And at around midnight, Seoul and the surrounding area will receive a mix of snow and rain, which should let up quickly. But tomorrow, the morning temperatures will be milder than today, but afternoon highs will be 2 to 3 degrees lower here in the Seoul metro area, so please keep that in mind. Now the weather outlook for this week is looking pretty nice. Temperatures over the Lunar New Year holiday should be hovering above 5 degrees Celsius here in the capital area and should be milder down south. With that in mind, here are the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul will get up to 5. And Daegu will see a high of 10, while Gwangju and Busan should top out at 11, respectively. Now, for other regions, it looks like Jeju will climb up to 12 in the afternoon, Daegu will get up to 8, while the top temperature on Mount Kimgangsan will be at minus 4. Now, that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world.
hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and let's send it back to Mark and Yusan in the studio. Thank you very much for the weather there, Ji Jian, and uh, those are the stories we're following at this hour. Mark and I will be back at noon tomorrow, but in the meantime, stay with Adirang for the day's headlines.